Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel, Bain. Douglas McGregor contends that Netanyahu sees escalation as vital for survival, viewing it as Israel's self-interest. While he doesn't share this perspective, he acknowledges it as Netanyahu's opinion and possibly his own salvation. McGregor outlines that escalating the war entails provoking Iran into attacking, aiming to prompt a substantial Iranian response. He asserts that without Iranian involvement, Netanyahu's ability to engage the United States in the conflict diminishes. Changes. In essence, the strategy involves goading Iran into attacking, thereby facilitating a broader conflict with a support. Yes, one would assume so. There's really no other option for him at this point. He understands the necessity of striking preemptively. It's merely a matter of timing. He's intent on involving Iran in this situation, believing it to be essential. However, he's overlooking the growing unity in the region against his actions. There's significant discontent in Turkey, especially after the recent election results wherein Farajan faced rejection, partly due to his support for Israel, despite his tough rhetoric. The Turkish populace desires action against Israel, and the Arabs are increasingly looking to Turkey as a leader due to its military capabilities. They recognize Turkey as the only sunny Muslim power capable of challenging Israel as their neighboring countries lack the necessary strength. Indeed, that's been my stance for quite some time, but it seems many fail to grasp the implications. Moreover, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine-Ukraine, fueled by Washington's actions, further complicates matters. The destruction in Ukraine, coupled with continuous provocations against Russia, including discussions about seizing Russian funds, makes it highly probable that Russia would support Iran if we engage in a conflict. Russian forces are strategically positioned with submarines in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea and troops in the Mediterranean. Therefore, if Netanyahu's plan succeed and were drawn into this conflict, it's inevitable that we would find ourselves in direct confrontation with Russia. In Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates, as well as other countries in the region, the elites are facing significant pressure. If they fail to take action, they risk losing their positions of power. General Sisi, for example, has attempted to navigate a delicate balance, speaking out against Israeli actions while also dealing with this country's substantial national debt and seeking support from the United States. However, the involvement of other global powers like Russia and China could potentially shift the dynamics. In Jordan, the king faces challenges despite his competence and leadership skills. He prefers to avoid conflict with Israel but must contend with the grievances of Palestinians within his borders who seek retaliation. These leaders are in precarious positions as they navigate complex regional tensions. Regarding the situation in Gaza, the actions of Israeli forces, including the use of unmanned aerial systems, have caused concern among the American public. Incidents where civilians are targeted, regardless of their affiliation with groups like Hamas, have occurred frequently. This pattern suggests a troubling disregard for civilian lives by Israeli authorities. The narrative portraying Gaza as a hub of enemies further exacerbates the situation with little restraint shown by Israeli soldiers or the operators of unmanned systems. He sees the situation in Washington as a matter of money talking. Most politicians, he believes, are heavily influenced by the Israeli lobby, prioritizing their own interests interests and financial support over anything else. He points out a common misunderstanding among Americans regarding the conflict, particularly emphasizing that while Gaza can be considered a war zone, it's not a conventional one. Hamas lacks sophisticated military capabilities like integrated air defense systems or naval forces, making them more akin to guerrilla fighters. He criticizes the notion of collective punishment and challenges the fog of war. Argument, citing incidents where Israeli troops mistakenly fired on their own people early in the conflict. This, to him, illustrates a reckless approach, reminiscent of past conflicts like Vietnam. He believes that eliminating an idea is far more challenging than eliminating individuals. However, he observes that the current campaign has inadvertently given Hamas a level of attention and fame it wouldn't have otherwise attained. This elevation of Hamas, he argues, fuels Netanyahu's anger and resonates with a segment of the Israeli public who advocate for drastic measures, including what he perceives as genocidal intentions. He sees emotions like hatred overriding rationality, leading to extreme proposals such as the annihilation of Arab populations in Gaza, the West Bank, and potentially southern Lebanon. Shifting briefly to the topic of Iran, 
He notes a recent silence from Iraqi and Syrian Shia militias, speculating that a recent strike could reignite their hostilities, targeting both American and Israeli interests. Yes, so I think the Iranian government pleaded with them to back off. And unlike the Houthis, who are far more independent and autonomous, the Iraqi Shiite militias headed the call for restraint. I think that restraint will now end. And they'll probably work very, very hard to attack us. And as I said, the Israelis, in whatever way they can, I don't think you're going to see a deliberate counterstrike from Iranian soil because, again, the Iranians don't want a war. This is the thing that has to be understood. Nobody in the region, except the Israelis in the United States, are enthusiastic about the war. He highlights the limitations of the Iranian ground forces, emphasizing the role of the Revolutionary Guard Corps in special operations rather than conventional warfare. While they support Shait militias, they lack the capacity to engage the Israeli Defense Force directly due to logistical constraints and distance. Iran's strength lies in its arsenal of rockets and missiles, including tactical and cruise missiles capable of targeting Israel. He suggests that in a conflict, Iran would likely unleash its full firepower as restraint becomes futile once missile strikes commence. He argues that Iranians wouldn't wait for potential U.S. intervention before acting, preferring to launch significant strikes if compelled to fight. Despite potential disruptions to their command and control, Iran's preparedness and redundancy in capabilities could prolong any conflict. However, he warns of the devastating consequences for both Israelis and Iranians, particularly highlighting the vulnerability of Iran's infrastructure to attacks. While the Iranian leadership seeks to avoid such outcomes, he acknowledges that circumstances could quickly escalate depending on Israel's actions. He's been hearing various reports, although lacking concrete evidence, suggesting possible involvement in recent events. Speculation arises about potential backing or knowledge from the US or UK country, given the complexity of the operation. He acknowledges the recent drone attack on an oil refinery as a sign of desperation from the opposing side, likely seeking financial gain amidst ongoing discussions in government. Speaker Johnson's support further indicates potential backing waiting for such actions. He observes the buildup of Russian military capabilities and strategic positioning, suggesting diminishing options for Ukrainian defense. With infrastructure and energy targets already hit, many towns are experiencing power outages, prompting civilian evacuations. The situation in cities like Markov is becoming dire, with residents fleeing as they anticipate prolonged Russian presence. This exodus, particularly among non-Russians, reflects a growing realization that this time, Russian forces may not withdraw. He believes that the elite ruling classes in Europe, particularly Western Europe, are reluctant to acknowledge reality because they fear electoral repercussions and eventual accountability. In their economic decisions, such as rejecting Russian energy in favor of cost-layer alternatives like wind and solar power are seen as self-destructive. He argues that civilization depends on affordable energy sources like coal, oil, gas, and nuclear power, dismissing the viability of renewable energy alone Ukraine. He finds parallels between Ukraine's efforts to bolster military recruitment and similar initiatives in the United States, where military branches seek to attract retirees back into service. Despite not facing the same level of conflict as Ukraine, the U.S. also grapples with manpower shortages. He criticizes proposals to allow migrants, including undocumented individuals, to serve in the armed forces and purchase firearms without background checks. Such policies, he contends, undermine national security and suggest a broader agenda aimed at both foreign adversaries and American citizens. He observes that Tusk, having formerly held a position in Brussels and being aligned with the EU and globalist ideals, likely doesn't resonate strongly with the Polish population. He anticipates Tusk's tenure may be short-lived, cite lukewarm public opinion on sending aid to Ukraine due to concerns about corruption and the existing presence of Ukrainian refugees in Poland. He doubts that financial assistance overcome manpower shortages in European armed forces, describing them as boutique organizations ill-equipped for large-scale warfare. He criticizes the idea that European military spending will significantly impact the situation, asserting that European nations lack the will and capability to undertake substantial military action without American leadership, which is unlikely.